the way of righteousness than to know it and then turn away from the sacred command that was given to them. Don't get caught up. Don't get conquered by it again. Or it's going to be worse for people who heard the gospel than those who never heard the gospel if they fall away. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, The Spirit says clearly that some people will abandon the faith in later times. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, where we're at right now, Paul talks about how this has happened with God's people back since the beginning. There's nothing new that's going on. Not this COVID, nothing else. This stuff has been happening in cycles throughout all the time that man has been on this world. As many people of Israel, they deserted God. Many people today are deserting the church. They're walking away from the church, and they're doing it for the same basic reasons as these Bible people. Now, check this out, please. This is theology. Those in the Word, they were delivered. They were baptized. Christ was with them. We're going to check that out today. Why did Israel fall away? And how does that apply to Christians falling away today? What four things did Israel do that many Christians do which caused God to send a destroying angel? On your bulletin, notice the next point. We should learn from other people's mistakes. We're supposed to learn from what those in front of us have done and what they have gone through. We should learn from it. Now, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul is using the Old Testament Jews as a warning to the church. He's talking to the church there in the book, but he's using the Old Testament. We are given the journey of God's people leaving Egypt and traveling towards the promised land. That's what we're doing. We're leaving Egypt. We're headed to the promised land. For 40 years, they wandered in the desert. That's what we're doing. We are wandering in the desert. As long as they walked with God, he blessed them. He anointed them. He gave them his favor on their lives. God provided for them. But instead of being grateful, they refused to live as God instructed them to live. So Paul lists how God blessed them in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. Would you go with me, please? I want you to notice the word all is repeated five times. Verse 1. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them. All of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them are ate the same spiritual food. All of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Christians in Corinth shared blessings in common with God's people Israel. So do we. We share the blessings. They were all blessed with God's guidance. So are we. We're blessed with the Father's guidance. I want you to see the Living Bible says God guided them by sending a cloud that moved along ahead of them. They left the slavery of Egypt for a brand new life. And it says in Exodus 13, 21, the Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud. He provided a, a, a light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. God guides his people. He's guiding you and I right now. He is still with us. He does it in even more powerful ways today. But chapter 10 of Corinthians, verse 1 says, they were all under the protection of the cloud. God hid his people from his enemies. I believe God will hide his people from his enemies today. I believe that he will do that with us, with you and I on our journey. I believe he will hide us from those enemies. So here's Exodus 14, 19. Look what it says. The angel of God. Is that Jesus in the Old Testament? Maybe. The angel of God who had been in front of the army of Israel moved and went to the rear. The pillar of cloud also moved until it was between the Egyptians and the Israelites. The cloud made it dark for the Egyptians but gave light to the people of Israel and so the armies could not come near each other. Folks, they were all saved when they went through the water. Here's chapter 10, verse 1, says, they all passed through the sea. So God provided a miracle of salvation 
By faith, they obeyed God and they went through the waters of the Red Sea, leaving their old life of slavery behind them. By faith, you and I obey God. We move through this world right now and we move through the sea that's in front of us even today. But here's the question. Would God have saved them? Would he have saved them if they refused to step into the water? Exodus 14, 22. The Israelites went through the middle of the sea on dry ground. The water stood like a wall on their right and on their left. But faith made them obedient. Please hear me. A lot of preachers and pastors and pulpits are not talking about obedient faith. We're supposed to have obedient faith. We're not supposed to have arbitrary faith or when we feel like it or when we're up to it. Faith made them obedient. Here's Hebrews 11:29. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. Now watch, folks. Others got in the water. They got in the water without faith, and they were not saved. Here's the Bible. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which you will accomplish for you today, for the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more. So we want to ask this question. Were God's people saved through the free gift of God? Were they saved through their faith? Were they saved through their obedience? Were they saved through the water? Or was it a combination of all these things? They were all baptized. Verse 2 of chapter 10 says, In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. They voluntarily joined with Moses in this act of obedience and faith. And I'm telling you again today, stay with it. Stay with it. Don't give up. Don't be afraid of what's coming in the months ahead with that. We have joy, joy in the Lord. So our act of obedience, we want to be a part of that with him. And this no doubt is a foreshadowing of Christians joining with Christ in baptism. Here's Galatians 3.27. All who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Now the commentators notice this. The cloud and the sea both consist of water. Both took the Israelites out of sight and then restored them again to view. So does water and those that are baptized. A person goes down in the water, is buried with Christ, and comes up like coming up out of a grave. It's very similar to what Israel went through. But not all the Israelites who were baptized into Moses in the Red Sea made it into the Promised Land. If there's anybody here today or anybody that's watching who has not voluntarily went down into the baptismal waters, please do it. Please do it. It's time to do it and do it right, understanding why we are going through that. After Jesus rose from the dead, he said in Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And all these people were blessed with God's provision. Do you believe that America has been blessed with God's provision? You believe that? Yes, we have. All your fruited plains, Lord, bless America. He has done that. But brothers and sisters, we've been out here around for about 250 years. You watch how long civilizations stand before they fall. You watch the limit of that. We are at or past many of those great civilizations, but they were blessed with God's provision. Here's chapter 10, verse 3. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. They ate manna. They ate the bread from heaven. They drank water from a rock. So here's what we say. Jesus is the bread of heaven. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the only Messiah. Jesus is the Redeemer. Jesus is the power and the glory. Jesus is the name. Jesus is the emancipator. Jesus leads his people. Jesus has a plan for us. It's Jesus right now. And Paul said the rock that provided water for Israel was Christ. So they were all baptized. They all ate the same spiritual bread. They all drank from the rock, which is Jesus Christ. But verse 5, I want you to stay with me. Don't get tired. says this. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered 
in the wilderness. God was not pleased. If you read in Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus, the Lord, is not pleased with most of the churches. He, two of them, does well. The other five, it's the same kind of a thought. He's not pleased. So they all came out of Egypt. The rock that went with them was Christ himself. And out of all those people, two made it in the promised land. Folks, can we say today, thank you, Father, that we live in grace. You agree with that? Thank you, Lord, for the grace that came from the blood. Thank you, Lord, for what that means. On your bulletin, go to the next point. So Paul now gives four reasons why God was not pleased with his people Israel. This is where it gets thicker. This is where we move from a little grizzly gray burger into a steak. Now in verses 1 through 4, the key word was all. In verses 7 through 10, the key word is don't. Do you know what word Americans hate the most? Don't. Don't. We don't want people telling us don't. Paul gives four don'ts using the Old Testament illustrations that will disqualify Christians, that will make God not pleased with Christians. So, on your bulletin, let's go. Don't number one, don't fall by worshiping the wrong thing. And here's the apostle in 1 Corinthians 10, 7, speaking to the church. He says right here, don't worship false gods as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people sat down to a feast which turned in to an orgy. This refers to Exodus 32, verse 3 through 6. The Israelites were tired of Moses being up on the mountain with God. He had not come down. They were tired. I'm tired of the COVID right now. They were tired that Moses was up on the mountain. So what did they do? They built a golden calf, an idol. Because Moses was gone, doing his thing with God. They didn't like it that it wasn't working out quick enough for them. They turned around and built a golden calf. Here's 32.6. They were up early the next morning and began offering burnt offerings and peace offerings to the calf idol. Afterwards, they sat down to feast and drink at a wild party, followed by sexual immorality. Even God's people can be disqualified if they worship false gods and engage in drunken sex parties. It angers the Lord. It makes him mad. He's not pleased with that. On your bulletin, number two, don't fall don't fall by sexual misconduct. Don't displease God by sexual misconduct. Here we are, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 to the Christians. We shouldn't sin sexually as some of them did, and 23,000 of them died on one day. This refers to Numbers 25. God's people felt free to have sex with whoever they chose to have sex with. And God sent a plague, a plague on his people that killed them by the thousands. Like God's people Israel, Christians can be disqualified for sinning sexually against the Lord. We displease the Father with that. On your bulletin, number three, here's the third don't. Don't fall by criticizing God. So this is verse 9. Again, it's written to the church. Nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did and then died from snake bites. This refers to Numbers chapter 21. Israel complained with these words. The people grew impatient with the long journey. And they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complain. There's nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many that were bitten, many were bitten and died. In response to the God's people and their never-ending whining and complaining, God sent snakes. Here's Numbers 21, verse 7. The people came to Moses and they said, we sinned when we criticized the Lord and you. Pray to the Lord so that he'll take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake, put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. People looked at the bronze snake after they were bitten and they lived. 
So let me ask you, and I ask the people that are watching, are you prone to be impatient? Are you prone to criticize? Do we criticize things going on, even criticize God, that things aren't up to our standards? I say again, I hate this time in America. I hate it. I'm griping. I admit that. I don't like it. Do we gripe? We've got to watch out for that snake, Satan. Look to the one who's hanging on the cross, and we will live. On your bulletin, here comes the fourth don't. Don't fall by grumbling. Now, we're back to the church. 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Paul says to us, and don't grumble as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. This may refer to number 16. Three Israelite men grumbled about Moses' leadership over them, and because they wanted to find fault, God provided a fault beneath them, and the ground swallowed them up alive. Whose fault was that? Some in the church of Corinth were grumbling about Paul's leadership over them. Their grumbling put them in danger of being disqualified, of having God not be pleased with them. So God's people fall through idolatry, sexual immorality, complaining, and grumbling. God has ways to remove similar offenders today. We're going to see it more and more and more in the coming months. He may not send plagues or snake or an open abyss to swallow up the offenders as he did back in the Old Testament times. On your bulletin, notice the next point. There are three ways, three, that God removes those he disqualifies. This is biblical driven. It's right from the word. Sometimes, check this out, God removes power from out of their lives. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says this. They will appear to have a godly life, but they will not let its power change them. If we don't repent, Jesus will remove we can ignore the warnings of God's word to the point that he will disqualify us and remove our power. So I ask you today, and I ask myself, are you as powerful in the Holy Spirit today as when you first believed? Are you as strong today as you were then? Because sometimes God will also remove our ministry to him. Notice on your bulletin down at the bottom, I wrote this terrible question. Because those that are watching and those in the room will know in a moment how many Christians once served that are no longer involved at all. Amen. Man, they were once serving the Father, but now they're not involved. Jesus said to the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, 4, these words. He said, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other, as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I'll come and remove your lampstand from among its place, among the churches. Look how far you've fallen, is what Jesus said. Turn back and do what you did in the beginning. The spiritual life of many people in the church of Ephesus was decaying. I'll tell you honestly, the spiritual life of many in America is decaying. Right now, it's hyperglide. They were sliding into lethargy. They didn't care very much. Idolatry, immorality, complaining and grumbling replaced a once vibrant service that they had to God. They've come down so far from what they used to be. They were about to be disqualified unless they repent it. Now sometimes, God removes our presence from the earth. He did it to his people in the Old Testament times and he'll do so today. Plagues and snakes in an open hole removed them from the earth as a warning to other Christians that we're gonna follow later on. That's why the apostle says in the next chapter, chapter 11, these words, he says, when we're judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Brothers and sisters, we're being judged by the Lord so that we won't be condemned. We will not be damned with the world. So we go through this judgment right now. So what's our takeaway? What do we grab today? Paul states two times the direct emphasis of the points he makes. 
In verse 6, he said, these things happen as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did. And down in verse 11, these things happened to them as an example for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Folks, this is a warning for us. I don't know about Dr. Fauci. I don't know about what's coming with this stupid thing they're going to put in our body. I don't know about all these things. I don't know what to believe anymore, but this is a warning to us. So on the bottom of your bulletin, at the, the last part, it says this. We get to learn what disqualified God's people and avoid ending up as they did. We will not end like they ended. We're going to avoid what happened. And aren't you glad that we can know where certain actions will lead us? We can know it ahead of time. That's why we study God's word. That's why we listen to the Holy Spirit. Because those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those who fail to learn from the mistakes of their predecessors are destined to repeat them. I don't know which way America's going to go. I don't know where our government's going in the fall. I don't know what it's going to be, but you and I are children of the living God. We rise up above that and beyond that. We've got a whole different power that's leading us than does our government and the governments of the world. Amen? So we will go with the Lord and we'll have joy in the Lord regardless of what happens. In contrast, here's what God says in Romans 15. Everything written long ago was written to teach us so that we would have confidence through the endurance and encouragement which the scriptures give us. We have confidence, we have encouragement, we have endurement. That's what we have today. But, one more time, they were all delivered. They were all baptized. Christ was with all of them, yet God wasn't pleased with most of them. And chapter 10, verse 12, says these words, So if you think that you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So what should we do? Man, we need to get saved. What else do we do? Repent. Let's repent. Let's come back to the Lord. Let's get right with the Lord right now. We need to come to the cross. The cross makes all the difference. We need to tell people the good news that Jesus saves and he is near and the world is getting closer all the time. You and I need to get right with God and be the evangelist that God has called us to be. We say amen? amen. So that's the warning. We don't want to do it. We're not going to fall. We're going to have victory. Would you stand up, please? Family, I ask you to consider coming forward today. I'll meet you right here. Others will come too. Step out. Maybe you know somebody going through a divorce. Maybe somebody in a marriage, they don't even like each other anymore. Maybe somebody's struggling physically. They're sick. They need the healer. The healer. God Almighty, the Holy Spirit. Come forward today. We will pray near you. Please come as we sing this song. Made it when it's all. 
Mike two, Mike two. Oh, we got it now. Well, since we got the volume back, James one twenty two. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. How great is our God! Now I want you guys to be convinced. I'm the best Christian you've ever met. Wait a minute. How great is our God to turn and trust in Him, and sometimes. People watch and look at our lives when we are in a mess. Is it safe to say it's okay that sometimes we get to be in a mess? And sometimes the mess becomes the message of how great our God is. In spite of our circumstances, in spite of the things that we maybe have even done that are borderline wrong or edgy, by God's grace, how great is our God to trust in him? I hope you can find that to celebrate this morning. He wants to put his power on display by cleaning up my mess. Because I have messes sometimes. So I know that we all can relate to that, but you need to declare this incredible gift. God sent his son to die on the cross to make everything new so we can learn how to be in process to put our mess on display to invite other people to find the solution in Jesus Christ. Find that this morning. We'll have a word of prayer. We'll take communion together. Father, we come before you right now and acknowledge how uh, messy this world is. Father, we never thought it would get this bad, and it's still going to get worse. So, Father, we declare that we want to trust in you and your outcome. You are still in control. You are still um, trying to have your kingdom come here on earth. So, Father, it is a challenge for us, but we trust that we get to cooperate with you and your Holy Spirit all because of what Jesus has done for us. Father, give us the faith and the courage to trust in you. And we thank you for this incredible gift. Praise your holy name for the gift of your son. So, Father, lead us and guide us in the name and the authority of Jesus. Amen, amen. Let's celebrate the uh, blood and the bread. Again, we want to thank you for your generosity. We're going to pray for the tithes and our offering. Also want to give a celebration commercial. Wednesday night Bible studies are the ones I get the access to the most, and they're just a lot of fun and engaging and insightful into the Word of God. So if you've got the time and the availability, come and participate, watching our brothers and sisters build one another up by God's grace. Let's pray for our offering. Father, we come before you and acknowledge that you are the giver of all gifts. And Father, we just want to celebrate back to you. Take our tithes, our offerings, 
our gifts, our talents. Help us build your kingdom right now here on earth, all because of what Jesus wants to do in us and through us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen, amen, amen. I just want to encourage you as we uh, go into the week. I know there's challenges ahead, and maybe if you're feeling like you're in a battle or you're feeling challenged, just remember uh, the lyric to that song we sung earlier, uh, what the enemy meant for evil, God can always use it for good, and only he can do that. So uh, may we give him the victory because the battle truly does belong to him. So let's be reminded of that. Hey, uh, we encourage you to let's go a little deeper. Maybe you're not involved in a Bible study. This is a Bible teaching church, and there's great opportunities to learn. So throughout the week, there's different Bible studies going on, and that's all listed in your bulletin if there's something you want to kind of pray about and get plugged into a, a study group. Hey, we're going to let the offering, it's almost to the back, make its way to the back, and then after that, you're free to go, and we hope to see you later in the week. We love you, and we want to encourage you this week. May it be a good week for you. The battle belongs to him. God bless. There was power in the mighty name of Jesus. 